Okay, and we're recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode with myself, Daniel Dumbrell, and Brian Berletic for another reaction video. And we're going to do things a little bit differently in that we will still welcome our returning guests and subscribers who are familiar with us, but I will also uh, put a, a brief introduction out there for the uh, new people who are coming in, because I have a feeling that a lot of people would have seen the recent CBC report on forced labor tomatoes from Xinjiang and probably smelt something a little bit fishy with it, but couldn't quite put their finger on it. And perhaps they're going to go out on the internet and look for people who maybe live in China, have been to Xinjiang, or have at least been covering this topic and the Xinjiang propaganda right from the beginning to explain to you why your spidey senses are tingling and break it down for you. So first of all, I'm Daniel Dumbrell. I am a Canadian who has been living in China for 12 years. I've been to Xinjiang. Um, and I started vlogging around the time of the Hong Kong protests when I was frustrated to see how different the reality on the ground was and what was happening um, in the media, what was being reported in the media. In the media. Uh, Brian, do you want to briefly introdu introduce yourself also? Sure. I'm, I'm Brian Berletic. I'm an American. I'm a former U.S. Marine. And I got into uh, analyzing geopolitics because... I watched the U.S. lie to the world about WMDs in Iraq, and I, I realized this was something that they repeatedly did, and this was something worth standing up for, uh, against, really. And so, uh, yeah, that's what I've been doing. And and because I think this Xinjiang uh, genocide story is the to China, the WMD story to Iraq, I think it's really important to speak up against it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try to do, uh, put a careful balance forward here while we're reviewing this video together in that we will try to we have a lot of other videos that really go down all the different rabbit holes and explain exactly what's happening. Um, but what we've got to do here is we've got to delicately balance this between not trying not to repeat too many things for our uh, existing subscribers, but also giving enough context to new people who are joining the channel. But if you are interested enough after what you hear here, I definitely suggest going over to Brian's channel and definitely taking a look through my history as well to get more information on the China topic. So without further ado, let's just get right into the actual video and we will react to it live. Hold on a second. Where'd you go? There we go. Okay. So now, uh, just a quick uh, uh, mention beforehand, they did also include a, a, a smaller part on Mexico, on issues with tomatoes that were coming from Mexico. Brian and I, well, at least I don't know anything about Mexico, so I don't know whether to believe it or not. I would think that it's probably pretty unbelievable if it's anything like their Xinjiang coverage. Uh, but we cut that out because that's not something we can really comment on. So here we go. Supermarket secrets. So unjust. It's really saddening. From tomato sauces to fresh tomatoes inside China. The allegations there about forced labor are not true. The incentive to lie is very high. Your favorite brands, Canada's <laughs> biggest grocers. That's terrible. That's horrible. What are we really buying into? You can't afford to miss your marketplace. All right, there's some stuff there that uh, we they're going to repeat, obviously, because that's the kind of preview trailer. But I just wanted to say that music. I mean, it, it seems like we're walking into the Gladiators arena and uh, Julius Caesar is, um, you know, just about to determine whether um, Russell Crowe gets to live or not. Um, they, they, they definitely get the mood. To <laughs> set. But uh, now they start with a little bit of a personal uh, aspect. So let's continue. we're going across multiple continents to some remote, dangerous parts of the world. In China? And Mexico. We're uncovering secrets about Canada's food supply. Be safe and keep us posted. And we're looking at something many of us eat all the time. Tomatoes, the fresh kind. Product of Mexico. And all those sauces too. Made in Canada from domestic and imported ingredients. Double concentrated tomato paste. Product of Italy right there. The industry has some serious issues. Cases of forced labor, poor working conditions, exploitation, 
and we want to know which of your favorite brands are connected to these problems. Uh, look here, product of India. One says product of Italy and one says half of Italy. What you see isn't what you get because the truth is not always on the label. All right. This label is pretty convincing. But first. You grab the tomato. Yeah. And just twist. Oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> I need a moment. <laughs> Nick only uses his own tomatoes. As a consumer, it's really hard to know, you know, like what you're buying, you know, when it comes to like produce and how the workers are treated. You may not know. All right, I just want to say before we continue, I might fast forward through that bit just in case um, in post you guys saw we just skipped over it. Basically, it was just a personal aspect, talking to a local Canadian who only uses local tomatoes, personalizing the host a little bit. Um, and I think the real stuff is going to start here. And yeah, uh, kind of ha okay. happens to be. Well, yeah. Do you want to say I, something before we start? Yeah, I just kind of yeah. want to I just want to say two things. One, uh, what they're going to do is. They're never going to prove that there's any sort of coercive or forced labor. They're never going to prove it. They're never going to show any evidence at all of it. They bring in this random chef from Canada uh, to to try to like represent the audience. And and at first they say things that make total sense, like it, you know buying local is something we can all identify with and probably agree with. Yep. And so we're we're going to experience this through his shoes. And he's going to kind of react the way we're, we're supposed to react when we hear these things. But I, I just want to point out, I want people to be aware and look for any actual evidence of coerced labor because they're not going to show any. That's right. I mean, this is going to be a really important exercise in propaganda to really understand even beyond this. I hope I hope this is an opportunity for people to learn about what to look out for in other cases, too. And to uh, emphasize that point, at the end of this video, they wrap it up also by talking to random people on the streets to make sure that you see these are this. These are the conclusions that ordinary people need to come to now that if because, again, if it was just a story of buying local and it wasn't it didn't come at the expense of slandering uh, somewhere else unfairly fine but they want to make sure that they ram that part into your head and of course there's an irony which i'll talk about later that if you really wanted to buy local in canada for ethical purposes <laughs> well there's some stuff to talk about about with with canadian farming there too but uh, we'll get to that eventually let's continue be one of the world's biggest producers of tomato paste but here's what's troubling about that industry we find state media reports showing the transfer of Uyghur Muslims and other ethnic minorities in the remote region of Xinjiang. I want to I want to say something here because I've read through the original articles uh, that have been reproduced by uh, think tanks and stuff like that. And when they say transfer, they transfer workers. Um, it's basically like people like you, you would understand uh, the largest human migration happens in China during Chinese New Year. Everybody works in the major cities or where the factories are. And during Chinese New Year, everybody goes back. There's plenty of documentaries you can go out there and see to verify what I'm saying is true. And I never, I, the, my worst nightmare here in China is traveling on the highway during Chinese New Year. There is a transfer of workers all the time. And actually, in some cases, factory workers are lucky where they get their expenses paid as well. Their, their travel expenses paid. But they twist this all into nefarious things. And they say that transfer of workers, they took a bus to work, you know, or they took a train to the destination. You know, it's like tra <laughs> transfer sounds so much more nefarious. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, uh, this document that they're showing, notice how they're literally, literally cherry picking just random words out of it to fit their narrative instead of just showing you the full translation. What, what yeah. is the purpose of this? It's to cherry pick the words out to reinforce the narrative they're trying to make. It has nothing to do with you actually understanding what this document is about, which is about poverty alleviation and matching people who don't have jobs with companies that don't have employees. That's all this is. And like you just said, it's they're trying to make it sound as nefarious as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that is important, the, the context. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that uh, China just completed the largest uh, uh, alleviation of poverty in human history. Hundreds of millions of people uh, lifted out of extreme poverty. There was an excellent documentary that PBS and CGTN did together on that, but it showed 
China in too positive of a light. So America pulled it from PBS. They never aired it. And CGTN ended up airing it on their own by themselves. This was part of that. This was matching people up with places that they could go to work, skills training and stuff like that. And it was all exactly taken out of context. Um, but yeah, we're going to get into a little bit more of that in a sec. Let's continue. Thousands allegedly work in tomato fields and in factories against their will. Where where does it say against their will? Yeah. Where yeah, does it, it say against it, their it, will? It, it doesn't say that it anywhere. Doesn't. It, it doesn't. Um, you, there are no legitimate documents that have been produced that say that. Um, I like in the beginning how they're like, they're, you know, thousands of workers are being employed in the tomato industry or whatever it was. It's like, uh, yeah, cool. Good. I mean, that's <laughs> yes, sounds like that industry. probably was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, what, <laughs> but but all of the video shows that the, this is done by machines. And the same thing happened with cotton picking. Like cotton is picked by Uyghur slave labor or, or forced labor. One of the biggest markets John Deere has is China because 90% of the, uh, I was at 70 or 90% of all of the cotton picking is done by machinery. And John Deere literally has receipts for hundreds of millions of dollars or, or, or I, I can't remember the exact number, but it's a massive market for them of automated cotton picking machines going to China. What, what do they do? What are they doing? Like they're just putting them, they're parking them in the shed and using forced labor instead. And they're just purchasing them. So they have the receipts to say, no, 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 we're using these. Like what, what, <laughs> Use some logic. <laughs> no Even sense. though the yeah. Chinese government says it's all voluntary. How prevalent is... Whoa, 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 whoa. So hold on a second. Hold on a second. They just showed us a Chinese government document saying it was forced and then saying the Chinese government says that it's not for... Wait, wait, which is it? You can't say it's <laughs> yeah, forced. Because the document didn't say that it was forced. Right. She just slipped that in and, and right. hopes the re uh, viewers didn't catch that. Absolutely. Forced labor in China's tomato trade. The prevalence is indeed industry wide. The risk of forced labor is. Uh... <laughs> I mean, Adrian, Adrian, Adrian. His name is on everything. He's part. He's a member of the Victims of Communism Memorial Fund that uh, lists Nazi deaths during World War II at the hands of the Soviets as uh, victims of communism. He's working for all of these think tanks that's aligned with the American foreign policy, and it's like almost all roads lead back to this guy. Yes, you know, funded by the U.S. government. He's his his Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation is funded by the. It was established and is funded by the U.S. government. So, how yeah. is this an objective that, source of yeah. information? The, 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 this is the piece of context that we're not going to go into too much depth here, but it's really important to understand that China and America is in a cold war with each other. America does not want to see China. Uh, overtake them. And there's a number of reasons for that. A lot of it has to do with uh, uh, China's inroads into uh, global South countries, resource rich countries that uh, 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 Western corporations previously had a monopoly over and who's, um, you know, a country that their military is regularly deployed to um, protect American commercial interests abroad, whether it be, um, uh, you know, United Fruit Company or all these different things, or even uh, the, uh, Britain with uh, BP and Iran when they overthrew the government there. This is something that regularly happens. They have a huge incentive to smash China back down. And this is an important piece of this. Usually what they do is they just sanction countries into, into absolute disaster, into poverty. But this is a new tactic. It's where it's like, put these stories out here and make sure that we're, uh, you know, slowly digging away at their economy. Uh, there's there's some other pieces, a terrorism piece that comes into this. Again, I'm going to very try to very carefully balance this to give enough context, but try to not repeat too many things that my existing subscribers already know. Endemic and systemic. Scholar Adrian Zenz has come under fire oh, for his... Oh, hold on. I got to rewind that a bit. The risk of forced labor is uh, endemic and systemic. Yes, did you catch that? Says there. Pay attention to that. He doesn't say forced labor is systemic... And all, he doesn't say that that's the problem. He says the risk. The, the risk. risk. Yes. Absolutely. Pay, pay attention to that. It, guys like this, and I've seen this before. With <laughs> I, I just engaged with a guy from a, a, a NATO-aligned uh, think tank in France. They never want to say clearly. They want to use this creative language to lead the audience to believe a certain thing. But because they know it's BS and that it will eventually be exposed, they had all of this fine print that they can point back to saying, ah, no, I didn't actually say that. I said the risk of it was very high, you know? <laughs> and and Daniel, I want to point out, because uh, we'll, we'll probably just take a quick look at his report on the cotton industry, which is which is this tomato thing is just the cotton thing told 
ver almost verbatim. Oh, we, we could just take a uh, we could just take a look at it right now. Uh, very quick, uh, it's course of labor in Xinjiang, labor transfer and the mobilization of ethnic minorities to pick cotton. And if you just go down to the conclusion, it says right here, overall, it is clear that labor transfers for cotton picking involve a very high risk of forced labor. This is his conclusion. This is his conclusion. So if you read through all of these pages, you're not going to find any evidence at all of coercion. And, and by the way, there are very clear definitions of what forced labor actually entails. He doesn't define any of this, let alone demonstrate how this is somehow right. taking place in Xinjiang, China. And um, let's just look, uh, let's go back to, hold on a second. Yeah, and so if you if you look at these conclusions, one, two, and three, again, it's it's just like the likelihood, the the right. risk of that. It's not talking about actual coercion. It's very and, very creative language. And and one thing that he claims is coercion is, is and he always points to this is how the the Chinese government goes to these villages and tries to impress upon them the necessity to work. And he even admits that they will come back over and over again until they get the, the number of workers. So if it was coercive, they would get them on the first trip because they would just force them to go and work. So he, right. you know, when you, read, when you read the actual evidence that he's presenting, it completely contradicts these, these conclusions that it's coercive. You're right. Uh, you're right, actually. And there was a there was a video that was taken out of context also where uh, China's own internal poverty alleviation videos for domestic media. There was one girl. Yeah, it took a, uh, it took a, 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 quite a while, uh, two or three times. But there was also a follow up where she was so happy that she made that decision. And it was very empowering for her. Uh, but that was cut out. And they say, you see, you see, this is what they're doing. N so so it, it, everything that Adrian Zenz is writing and everything we've seen from the videos is that they definitely go in and they try to convince them, but they're not forcing them. In this report on, on the screen, if you read through this, he does actually include quotes from people who went through this program and how happy they are. He's just saying um, he's suspicious that that's how they really feel. So that's what that's what all of this claim of of coercive labor is about. It's him just assuming that they couldn't possibly really feel that way. He, he doesn't qualify it. He doesn't present any actual evidence. And between uh, Adrian Zenz and Aspie, which you, you just briefly mentioned, they will just cite other people's hearsay claiming that it's abusive, it's coercive. These are people that aren't even in Xinjiang. And they'll believe that without question. But then when people say positive things about it, it couldn't possibly be true. So there's a, a double standard there that, they, right. that they're using. And and one thing I want to say, too, is that I, after uh, interacting with what was <laughs> like the Adrian Zenz of France, um, and I'm going to do a dedicated video on him, what I realized is that there are certain things that these people will never, ever say outright. They're very yeah. happy with misleading the public. But essentially, if you read their entire report and you read their fine print and you read the parts that they don't quote when they're talking to the media, Basically, what they're saying is there is not enough evidence to say that there's a genocide if they're talking about the genocide issue. And there is not enough evidence to say forced labor. They will always slip around this and say, well, if our suspicions are true, it's a genocide. Well, no. It, do you are you calling it a genocide? Are you calling it forced labor? Well, no, you really I, I managed to get this guy to admit, no, he doesn't. And I said, I saw so that when you were. Yeah. When you were in this interview, you said that. And, and he referred to Adrian Zenz also. He said, if we are to, uh, if, if Adrian Zenz's revelations are true, then we can call it a genocide. But I managed to get him to admit to me that he doesn't call it a genocide. But he what he won't say is what that obviously inadvertently means, is that he doesn't trust Adrian Zenz's report enough. That is what he'll never say. So if there's anybody from the media, if there's anybody from CBC watching this, the next time just try to really nail them down on, are you saying that there is forced labor? If you're not, why is that? Is it because there's not enough evidence yet? Is it because you're not 100% sure? And they'll just snake around this in a way that they'll present it in a way where they're kind of saying that, but they really, really want to mislead the public. I don't want to go on too much, though, so maybe we'll continue with the... Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, the, yeah sorry. I, I, I tend to uh, <laughs> do that. <laughs> there's, well, there's a lot to it. Under fire for his research on China. I, I want to say... Uh, sorry, I got to stop. What they're not going to say 
what he came under fire for. They're not going to actually mention any of the criticisms towards Adrian Zentz because there's a lot of very valuable criticisms. There's more coming. He says he's being targeted by the Chinese government. Are you worried about your personal risk? I have to be reasonably worried, and we have had to take uh, basic uh, precautions. <laughs> like, like, like that, never sitting that, that in a is, chair in case a Chinese, <laughs> in case yeah, a Chinese spy why... loosens the legs on the chair and yeah. he has to stand at yeah, all yeah, times. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that is why I requested a standing interview because at any moment maybe I must run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but oh. what, 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 what they. Um, what they don't tell you is no, it's not only under the, the 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 Chinese government that his work has come under scrutiny from. I mean, it's come for it, it's come under scrutiny from scholars all over the world, including Dr. Stuart Gilmore, professor of biostatistics at St. Luke's International University in Japan, who took him to task on his data, saying, Your data doesn't conclude this. Your data doesn't even suggest this. It doesn't even come close to this. And that was on his um, um, uh, genocide uh, sterilization report. And he wasn't able to meaningfully respond to Dr. Stuart Gilmore. But what this CBC reporter wants you to, to, to believe is that it's only Chinese people who disagree with Adrian Zenz. And that's far, far from the truth. And that's exactly why they want to end the conversation at. He came under a lot of criticism, but they're not going to mention any of that criticism. They're not going to ask him to answer any of that criticism. They're not going to force him to answer the questions that he refuses to ask, which is coming from that criticism. And that's really important to uh, uh, to recognize. Let's go. These documents were taken by some of the media partners and shown to a man named Adrian Zenz. Adrian Zenz uncovered a government report. Adrian Zenz, the senior Adrian fellow Zenz. in China studies. Adrian, Zenz. Adrian has helped us. As seen both. on TV. Well, what, what, did I, what did I say? All roads <laughs> lead back to Adrian, more or less. Yeah. <laughs> And other people on TV said Adrian Zen, so he must have credibility because oh, other yeah. people are saying his yeah. name on TV. <laughs> From their homes to work in China's tomato fields. Beijing set up an unprecedented police state. What's known as labor transfers. Tomatoes from Xinjiang are inexpensive, and one of the reasons for that is cheap labor. Okay, 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 okay. See, he's not going to say forced labor because he can't. The one thing he can say is cheap labor, because probably, relatively speaking, compared to the West, the tomatoes picked in the West, it is cheaper labor. But he's not going to directly use the word uh, uh, forced labor, because he wants to leave those little pieces of fine print in there so that when the level of BS that is finally exposed, he's got these little little pieces he can point back to. Yeah. And those who refuse to work could be sent to internment camps like this. Listen to what one camp survivor told the U.S. Foreign Affairs Committee. I was tortured with an electric stick. Many young women were crying, screaming when they were told they would be sterilized. I am asking governments around the world to wake up. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, Daniel. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm going to take this. I'm sorry. I'm going to take this. Yeah. yeah. This is the point in this broadcast where you realize that these CBC reporters did no due diligence whatsoever, not even the slightest. They had a conclusion in mind, and they wanted to produce this piece to prove that. And that's why they put Tersenay on the screen. Well, let, let, let's talk about Tersenay. You know, oh, you know Tersenay real well, don't you, Brian? This is something yes. I... I, I, yes. I, I yes. So well, I was just going to so, say, uh, yeah. well, well, real quick, I just want to say she has nothing to do with cotton or tomato uh, farming. So I don't know what, what relevance she has, except they're claiming... Uh, maybe some relationship to these detention facilities, but but Daniel, I know you, you you're gonna tear this one apart. So oh yeah, uh, yeah go yeah. ahead. Even yeah. if we want to take it as face value, like yeah, first of all, what what is she doing in this uh, you know forced labor tomato picking story? She's got nothing to do with it. But they need to sprinkle these pieces in to set the mood, to get your emotions in the right place, to lead you towards the conclusion that they want. So. Tersenay, let's see, what was her first story to BuzzFeed before she got a lot of uh, airtime from CNN and BBC? Oh, I wasn't beaten or abused, she said. The hardest part was mental. It was something I can explain. You suffer mentally being kept someplace, forced to stay there for no reason. You have no freedom, you suffer. And then also in the other part, she said that it wasn't actually that bad. I had my phone and stuff like that. This is assuming that she really was in there. But what casts doubt on the on the on the story that she was even there before she uh, upgraded her story to being abused and uh, uh, having you know being sexually assaulted and all of this kind of stuff? 
is that she said that um, she was under arrest. She was under house arrest from January to June in 2019. But in one place, she shared her passport without the passport date, uh, uh, date uh, renewal date blurred out. And it was March 2019. Well, hold on a second. In China, you can't you can't renew your passport uh, unless you go in person. And and furthermore, if this was a person that was being beaten and tortured and stuff like that, they were they were issuing her a passport to leave and and, and tell her story. I, I thought they were trying to genocide this person. And so there was a petition on change.org with 4,000 signatures asking BBC why they didn't do their due diligence on this person who is very, very clearly lying and who has massive holes in their story. And they refused to respond to it. BBC was actually going to do a hit piece on me and they asked me really superficial questions. And I said, listen, th these are really superficial questions. If you were talking to Adrian Zenz, you wouldn't ask him questions like this. You would ask him meaningful, respectful questions. But whatever, I'll answer your questions as long as you answer the questions that are uh, that 4,000 people want to know the answer to on the story. And they refused. And they actually dropped me from the story. They got spooked. <laughs> but uh, when CNN finally uh, aired it, which was after there was a, after a lot of people were like, hold on a second, CNN decided to blur out <laughs> the passport renewal date. Why would Everything they do that? Fine. Her name, yeah. you know, it, it, all this other stuff is fine. But they blurred that out. They blurred out the only hole in the story. And that is when you realize that these outlets know exactly what they're doing. Either CBC did criminally negligent uh, due diligence on this, or they know exactly what they're doing. And based on how these BBC journalists conduct themselves, I'm assuming that the CBC journalists know exactly what they're doing also. They are agents of propaganda here, and they're doing what they got to do to get ahead. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it, that, that's, when, that's when they really lost all credibility here. Well, I mean, they, were, they lost their credibility earlier, but that's when it really drives the home point home. Yeah. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add or we continue? Uh, yeah, just just keep going. The okay. Chinese government is really trying to break the back of the weaker people. Um, they co they're considered to be extremist. The end game is to try to optimize the weaker population by reducing their population growth to really significant. Optimize. Okay. Let's let's hear. Let's hear. Let's hear. I think we've got a little <laughs> bit more. Let's see. I think they will put, put some okay. documents. Simply on Simply alter their uh, ethnic makeup and uh, their uh, religious uh, situation. It's why the U.S. government decided. Uh, uh, okay. Um, w w they actually use a document, so maybe we'll get. I know what you want to say. So let let let's wait till the document comes up and we can talk about his mistranslations of national unity and all that stuff. That's what you wanted well, to talk well, about, right? Well, actually, he, he said they claim that they're extremists, but there, there actually was uh, regional, then national, and then international terrorism emanating out of Xinjiang. And so it's not something that China was imagining or just accusing certain groups of Uyghurs of. This was something that was actually happening, something the Western media used to report on all the time. I, I have a BBC article from 2014 where it's just paragraph after paragraph just describing these horrific attacks where scores, sometimes hundreds of people were being killed. They did it in Xinjiang. They did it elsewhere in China, Beijing, Kuoming. They did it here in Thailand. Uh, thousands of them went to Syria to fight alongside Al Qaeda and, and still ISIS. Yeah, so still there. They're, yeah, they're, that's, those are extremists. There's no two ways about it. So he's, he's acting as if China's imagining this. This is a fact that even the US government acknowledges. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I'm actually going to expand on that point a little bit later on towards the end of the sure. video um, on the on sure. the terrorism issue. So let's let's see what they say. Now. ...to ban tomato and cotton imports from the Xinjiang region earlier this year. I fully believe that other countries, including Canada, should follow suit and do the same. The whole so the, again, uh, he's uh, recommending sanctions on products, which he's not exactly sure whether his theories are correct or not. It's just because when he actually talked to real people in Xinjiang, they told him something that contradicts with the story, but he doesn't quite believe them. So to stay on the safe side, let's sanction them. Yeah. And um, this has serious consequences for Uyghurs in China. And I'll, I'll get to that part a little bit later as well. Old truth is hard to get at because so few people have escaped Xinjiang. But we find someone who wants to share his story. We managed to interview a man who escaped with his family. I, I, like, es, es, like escaped. Very few managed to escape. They won't quantify that at all as well. He did. Holy smokes. We played part of that interview for Adrian and Nick. 
If they're not in internment camps, my family is picking tomatoes. They are living under fear. Adil says he was a political prisoner in the late 90s, forced to do hard labor in fields. It was so hard, I thought I would die. We're changing his name and concealing his identity to protect of him. Of course, of course, yeah. It's to protect him. It's not because every single time they don't protect their identity. A lot of people come out online and say, hold on a second, your story is changing. Or hold on a second, that doesn't really make sense. Or hold um, on a second... I'll if, if you're a Uyghur who escaped, you know, what was it shortly after the 90s or for a while? Why aren't you either speaking English or Uyghur? Why are you speaking Mandarin Chinese? This is not the level of Mandarin Chinese that a Uyghur laborer speaks. I mean, there's all kinds of things that, that so that's why they have to protect. Yeah, anyway. And then on the, in the article, because they have an, a, a company, an article, I was like, you know, I love finding out how these people left Xinjiang because they always say these people can't escape Xinjiang. But then it turns out most of them left legally on their passports. And so when this guy, I don't know if you if you if you saw in the article, he said when he left China, he was so surprised that he was able to freely leave. It must have been a miracle that they use the word miracle. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Did you? Uh, did you I, 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 I just want to point out, do you see where he's walking around? He's walking yeah. around Washington, D.C. I'm, I'm pretty sure if you if you uh, re rewind a little bit, you'll see the oh, Washington yeah. Monument. Oh, yeah, that's that is Washington, D.C. <laughs> where all of these Uyghur separatist groups, which are funded by the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, America's regime change arm, which the original founder said that what the CIA used to do covertly, they now do through the NED, all based out of that general area. So I just want to point out that um, they, they're also talking about, uh, they also reference uh, the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project in the CBC article that accompanies this video. And if you go to their website, they admit that they're funded by Washington-based National Endowment for Democracy. So this is the only source that they have is people being funded by by the US government. Adrian Zenz, the organization he re he, he's a representative of is funded by the US government. Uh, the National Endowment for Democracy is funding all of these these Uyghur groups. And if you go to the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project, which is looks like it's based in Canada, they have the, the Uyghur separatist flag. It's all incorporated into yeah. into their website design. So, I mean, it's it's very yeah. dishonest for them to, to, to do this. And I, I also yeah. wanted to say... Uh, Go ahead. Uh, he, he's he's anonymous. He won't show his face. He's in Washington. He's been there since the '90s. I mean, what is he afraid of? Why? It's just like you said, they they don't want to show you because then you can start poking holes. But hey, I have an anonymous source sitting right next to me. I can't show you who they are, but they said they know this guy and he's a liar. Yeah. So now uh, I mean, he said yeah. he said now who's telling the truth? That's why you need to have actual evidence. Absolutely, absolutely, and um. Uh, people need to understand the implications because some people don't Well, like, OK, all right. So they're funded by the U.S. government. Um, there may be some people who naively think that the U.S. government stands for democracy and freedom. Uh, no, they overthrow democratically elected governments and they install people like Pinochet and they do these things regularly. The most important thing is that, that it aligns with their geopolitical or corporate interests. And when. The U.S. government has been caught lying so many times to justify war or aggressions against um, uh, rivals, uh, you know, whether it be the weapons of mass destruction, whether it be the fake Naira testimony, whether it be the uh, false flag attack to get America into the Vietnam War. As soon as there's any narrative that's funded by even one dollar by Washington, D.C., you need to be extra careful and extra suspicious. And now we have this so-called escapee this you know uh, activist who left china legally because of a miracle not because his story is bogus who's coming to us straight from washington dc well <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> that was a good catch i didn't see that i didn't see yeah, that and, initially. and also on, on on the website of this organization cbc sites uh they refer to xinjiang as east turkestan so th these are all separatist, separatist. groups these were th these yeah. were people that were driving the extremism that that Adrian Zenz is pretending is exists only in the imagination of the Chinese government. And it's hidden uh, in plain support, sight. Yeah. America's support for extremism and how that ties in again is something I'll talk about a little bit at the end. Yeah. Uh, but sure. let, let us continue on from here. Adil says he was a political prisoner in the late nineties, forced to do hard labor in fields. 
Oh, so, so, so to clarify, he did lab forced labor in the 90s. We're not exactly sure when he came to the U.S., but whatever. He's not he's not speaking English and he's not speaking Uyghur. He's speaking Mandarin. I mean, that's a little bit of a red flag there to begin with. Not necessarily a complete um, uh, I I issue, but something to keep in mind. Hey, Don, it was so hard, I thought I would die. We're changing his name and concealing his identity to protect him. They often have to recruit a lot of people to harvest those tomatoes. Most of the time, they didn't pay. He says his family back home is under constant threat of losing their land, facing a fine, or even worse. If some uh, th th Okay, I didn't notice this the first time, but losing their land. Now, this is interesting because I've been to Xinjiang. I've been on some of the plots of land that the local Uyghurs have. Um, because they have their own plots of land, um, you know, the same kind of a thing after the land reforms, uh, land was redistributed out to the people um, fairly evenly. And people grow their own products on their own land. So you're talking, some of them grow cotton, some of them grow tomatoes, they can grow whatever they want on their own land. So are they being forced to work on land other than theirs? And then if that's the case, who's farming their land then? There's a risk to lose their land, which is predominantly used for farming, especially in the in the south. I went to some of these uh, uh, farms on the outskirts. So, what, like, what what is the story here that they're being forced to farm their own lands? There's something that's not adding up here. If, if you if you listen, if you if you yeah. listen to him carefully, he's saying, "I don't know if they're in a camp or if they're picking tomatoes." And it's weird that he's he thinks that they could either be in a camp or picking tomatoes because. We've been told stories that they're being forced to work in electronic factories or in cotton fields. Is his family either in camps or in tomato fields because CBC is talking about tomato fields? Or is it because he has produced or shown some sort of evidence that they could be in a tomato field? They never explain that. I just think it, the, the whole thing makes no sense and has no credibility whatsoever. Yeah, and, and, and if he is forced to assume, like, I mean, if they were on a tomato field or something like that, I mean, is he saying that he, they have no access to any technology, they have no access to WeChat, they have no way to communicate? Or so is, is he making this assumption? Let, let, let's, let's be really generous and assume that he really doesn't have any contact with his family and he's making all of these assumptions. Well, then is it possible also that they could possibly be choosing not to communicate with you because you're in Washington, D.C. and working for yeah. a, a separatist organization. Because that's yeah. what happened when I when I pressed Arslan Hidiat when he said his father-in-law was missing. And uh, after my interview with him, I found his father-in-law because he's a famous comedian and actor, and he was still acting and showing up on uh, comedy shows and making commercials for Lincoln Navigator. And I'm like, uh, Arslan, are you sure? Maybe he, this guy just doesn't want to talk to you because you're a violent separatist and you said that your goal was to be a better extremist in 2021. I mean, do you think that might have anything to do with it? And then shortly after that, all of a sudden, he's looking for a new father in law. And I said, whoa, 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 hold on a second, Arslan. Um, uh, you said your your father in law was this guy. Why is it now this other guy? He says, oh, this is my new wife. <laughs> it's like this guy must have a dating profile where he's only interested in women who have missing fathers. And I'm afraid I'm, I'm kind of worried now. Did I ruin his last relationship because I found his father in law and he's like, crap, I've got to find a new wife now. <laughs> like, yeah, every, every, different, different strokes for different folks, I guess. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Yeah, fine. Could they go to jail? Oh, dude, yes, no, this is very common. Some of your family members were forced to pick tomatoes? Dude. Yes. <laughs> How do we know that's I true? Mean, that's... How do I we mean, know that's I mean, true? And why why is this so so this chef guy that they just this random guy they brought on, he's He's reacting the way CBC expects the audience to react. This is right. this is giving us the cue on how we're supposed to feel. Absolutely. And you actually, you should be very critical. Uh, I don't know who this guy is. You didn't tell me who he is. He's some guy walking around Washington, D.C. Yeah, where gave, all of these his lies come out. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. No, no. I mean, the, yeah, the guy he's reacting to these, these claims. Right. I mean, why would you take that at face value? I mean, I mean, th this guy, I, I have nothing against this guy who's reacting this way, because it's I mean, if you're not looking at this stuff in the depth that we are, this is exactly yeah. how you would react. And they know that they, they know exactly how to exploit people and push whatever false narrative they want. Um, yeah. And they and, and just to just to be on the safe side, they still want to broadcast a guy like this, like you said, to make sure uh, audience, uh, please remember, this is how we expect you to react just in case there was anybody else 
who somewhere along the lines was like, hang, hang on a sec. There's something yeah, that's not making yeah. sense here. And then they cut to this guy and said, guys, 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 this is how you're supposed to react. You know, they don't have anybody else on who's skeptical about it. They don't bring anybody else in who says, you know what? This is why I'd like to be a little bit more cautious about this. No, they're directing you in a very, very specific direction. So unjust. It's uh, it's really saddening. Uh, it's a horrible situation that just shouldn't be happening. The Chinese Communist Party has many ways to torture you. No one can escape their evil hands. Except it's him. It's so powerful, you know, when you research something and you see it, and then a person says it's happening. It's so important. Why is it? This was the guy I was looking for all along. Every time I was speaking to people in Xinjiang, they said everything was fine. This is this is the kind of person I was waiting for. And Need to go to, to Washington, D.C. Yeah. I'm on CBC. I'm not going to tell you about any of the people who said they were happy because this was the guy I was looking for, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's so hard to hear from Uyghurs and what's going on really in the region. The, the flow of information is so incredibly controlled. Adrian says grocers need to know more about their supply chains. The companies that use tomato paste really need to take a really hard look. We're going to take a hard look ourselves, getting inside access to some of China's biggest tomato producers, posing as Canadian traders with the help of our art director and this website. So we'll call it Richmond Limited. I think we could use another image here. Yeah. Looks good competitively priced, highest quality. I think those are some key buzzwords. And it looks like it's ready to go. And then we set up three factory tours in Xinjiang. Hi, my name is Asha, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. These companies think we're trying to purchase tomato paste. We're looking for about 1,500 to 2,000 tons. We can uh, ship the to a uh, global market. Don't worry about that. They show us their factories and their fields. Can they hold up a tomato? I don't know if you just saw their face. They look so disappointed. They're not seeing any like for, like people in like prison uniforms, like picking men on horseback with whips yeah. and nets. Yeah, her face was like, oh shit. What what are we gonna? How are we gonna spin this? Tomato for us to see. <laughs> Very nice. Very Looks good. The rep at this company sure gives us a lot of info. Oh, this is good. All right, so they're gonna give her a lot of info. If they give a lot of info. And this is going to be, they're going to get, they're going to find what they want, right? Washing uh, fresh tomatoes. Oh, an elevator. It's an automated machine. Huh. They're, so they're not, they're not, wa okay, so at least we know now they're not washing the tomatoes with forced labor. But we notice a red flag. You have all your certifications. Yeah. Yeah. When they send us a hard copy. Pa pa pause this right here. What, pause what this right here. What is this? This is, I'll tell you what this is, because at first I was like, I, I don't know what to make of this. But when you when you look, this is either a brochure or this is a section of their website. And what this is, is if you read, if you read the, the print, there, it's just some generic explanation about their certification. This isn't them asking for a specific certificate. And this is the, the hard because they're going to say they sent us a hard copy. That's not what this is. This is either a brochure or part of a website. And it's a very generic explanation and I, I used to do web design before I got into industrial design and what you would do is you would put like stock image in there as a representation of what this section was about and then maybe you would have like some uh, I mean if it's a cheap website you know if you don't invest in a lot in your web design you're, you're going to get a very generic feel to it that's what you get and they never they never explain what this is they're just trying to make it like they tried to trick them you you could clearly see that this is stock image a uh, stock image that they put in. It's like when you go to a a, a website and they, they're, you go to About Us and they show just generic like white people in an office well, talking to each other. Yeah. It's like that's what well, this not, is. Well, not only that, does the, does that actually look like that's a photo of a laptop screen, or does that look like that's you know? So they sent they first of all they sent an image that was the perfect um, aspect ratio for their laptop. Um, but I'm not I'm not convinced that that's even actually being displayed. That's a photo of the actual. What's actually being? No, 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 no. That's not. not that's there. I, I think what they're showing is some kind of brochure or section on their right. website, 
and the English is broken. So what I'm thinking is it's just a poorly designed uh, online brochure or a okay. very poorly designed website. That's what that is. Right. That's not the well, hard up, copy yeah. of anything. Right. So they end up giving, yeah, because I mean, I have a business. I have a business here in China and and you you have your, 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 your the, the, the business certificate. If they ask for that, you can very easily send them that. And I mean, it's in Chinese. Mine is uh, uh, the at least the company name portion is bilingual because I have an English and a and a, a, a Chinese name for my company. Um, and for, for those of you who are uh, not familiar with uh, me, I have a, a brew pub, a uh, craft beer brew pub here. Actually, a lot of my own subscribers don't even know that because I hardly talk about it. But uh, this is really, really suspicious as a business owner in China that, 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 that this would happen. But anyways, they, they give a reason later on and we can take it for face value uh, when they say why they sent them something generic when they asked them for this. Looks like a generic template. Certificate of completion, name and family name. They're blank forms, something anyone can find online. Back on our virtual tours, we ask outright about Uyghur workers. Are they local laborers in those fields or are there any Uyghur workers? A denial at first, then a denial at first, okay, then what? And they admit to using Uyghur farmers. Can you confirm the farmers that you deal with? Uh, Finally, the children. Okay. Another company tells us they've stopped using Uyghur workers this year. She was answering a question about production. And for farming, that makes sense to me. Because again, the... A lot of Uyghurs have their own plots of land. They have a, they have cotton or tomato or whatever it is they choose to grow, and they sell to these big corporations. Um, I have uh, I actually have a video on my channel where I went and visited one of these uh, small plots of land. So, in terms of production, these companies are not hiring Uyghur workers anymore, which is actually tragic, and we'll get into that in a second. But it's very hard to get around. Uh, sourcing tomatoes that aren't picked by Uyghurs because Uyghurs are picking it off of their own land and selling it to these corporations. Just to give you a little bit of context about how a lot of the oh, economics work here. Yeah. Also on the CBC article that accompanies this video, they, they ask them if there's forced labor and they say no. And then they ask, do you have any Uyghur laborers? And they say yes. And they're like, aha, we caught you. Because they're just assuming that Uyghur la all Uyghur labor is forced labor. And it's not. It isn't. And they haven't proven any of that. And so it's they're playing semantics and they're they're being extremely dishonest. It, it's they did it in their article and they're doing it in this video. You know, it's really weird to like figure out exactly what the argument is. It's like, are they assuming that Uyghurs don't want to work and they have to be forced to work, but they're still getting a salary? Because, again, Adrian Zent says it's it's a cheap uh, labor. Uh, so what exact what exactly is the story here? It's not it's not exactly adding up because there is this assumption um, that you have to go with based on the way that they're framing this is that Uyghurs don't want to work. There's no way that there could be a Uyghur person that was voluntarily working for a salary. They must have been forced to do it. it it's just this weird uh, logic. Um, you're right. Yeah, let's continue this. Hmm. Why is that? The allegations there about forced labor are not true, and they're not being treated unfairly. Okay. Yes. This is really, really important. This could have been a huge epiphany moment for them, where they said, whoa, hold on a second. This is institutionalized racism. Unless, unless again, they think that the only way Uyghurs are going to work is if they're forced. But they're saying these companies are refusing to hire Uyghur workers because of media propaganda. This is the effect of media propaganda. If that is true, that is absolutely tragic. That's, that's institutionalized racism that's being driven by the work, the shoddy work that media outlets are doing. Yes. Just to err on the side of caution, just to be abundantly cautious. How about we make sure that we don't become media propaganda and further contribute towards this issue, taking away the livelihood 
of Uyghur people based on shoddy reporting. But did they do that? No. No, they didn't. They decided to do exactly what this person was trying to tell them is going on. But they don't care about this issue. This isn't their goal. Their goal is very specific, and they don't give a shit if this other possible possibility, because we're, they're working on possibilities now, even according to Adrian Zenz's own admissions, they don't even want to consider the implications of this possibility because it doesn't lead audiences towards where they need to go. Yeah. And just just think about it. Adrian Zen said there's a risk, not that it's happening. They show right. these government documents and they claim that it says forced labor, but they didn't actually show the word forced anywhere. And if you translate the whole right. thing, there's no no mention of it. And their only source claiming that this is happening is some anonymous guy walking around Washington, D.C., who, who they won't even tell you who he is. And he has no credibility. The, you know, police are not going to say, uh, yeah, or no no judge in a court is going to say, yes, they're guilty because some some blacked out guy uh, in a video said said that it happened. Nobody's going right. to buy that. So they're, they are doing right. exactly what you're saying, Daniel, exactly what and you're saying. I, 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 I hate to beat a dead horse, but I really want to drive home the point that these people are willing to take precautionary actions based on risk, but they're refusing yeah. to take any precautionary reactions based on this risk, that what they're saying is actually true, that media outlets are producing bullshit and it's affecting the employment prospects of Uyghurs. They refuse. They refuse to acknowledge Absolutely. this risk. They only want to acknowledge risk that, again, takes people into a certain direction. It's absolutely, it's absolutely despicable. Propaganda. I mean, what else could they say? They, there's no way they could say, oh, yeah, we are forced labor, right? The government would close them down. Oh, yeah. I wonder if, Adrian, if you're allowed to say anything else or the government would close down their funding or the, the, yes, the, exactly. your funders who are aligned with American foreign policy would shut you down. You can't say anything different than that, can you? That's exactly why you're not saying in very clear terms that there's not enough evidence to say that there's forced labor because your funding would get shut down. Thank you for telling <laughs> Daniel. us the logic that you're working with. You you remember in the beginning he said the incentive to lie is very high. That is that is cutting both ways because he's going to say it again too. It, it applies yeah. to him just as much as he claims it applies to the Chinese Ab government or any of these companies. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm glad he acknowledged this frame of thinking because the audience is what they should be doing is saying, okay, well, how does this logic apply to you? And of course. If you engaged him on that, he would try to say, well, no, 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 no. We, 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 we shouldn't apply this to, to me, of course, because, you know, <laughs> I'm saying I'm saying what, what, what I want you to believe. You know, these companies who operate in Xinjiang, they actually need to be on good terms with the government. Um, I'm pretty sure a think tank that is funded by the government or that is funded by people who are aligned with American foreign policy uh, needs to be on good terms with the government as well, right? Again, all right, okay, let's let's apply let's apply this logic equally, Adrian. We have documents showing at least two of these companies are coordinating the transfer of Uyghurs with Chinese authorities. In the so name what? of ethnic Um you know in uh yeah, in, in, in Canada, we during tomato, we, we have uh, we have a, a town called Leamington in uh, Ontario, and it is called the tomato capital of North America. And every year during harvest season, there are workers that come in from the Caribbean and Latin America to pick tomatoes. They are organizing the transfer of workers to Leamington, Ontario, just outside of Windsor, Ontario, not too far from Detroit, to pick tomatoes. Uh, and, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm based in Thailand, and I have a lot of friends who, when they were younger they did these work and travel visas and this, this is what happened to them. And, and these visa schemes are organized by these Western governments specifically to attract people to, you know, study, but then also work and these kind of manual labor jobs, including out in fields, uh, picking fruit and gathering vegetables. And they don't, they don't have like full benefits or, or get really good salaries. So uh, that's, that's the same thing, but people uh, are choosing to do this and they're not going to them to, to find out about this. O oftentimes there are agents who go around in, in Thailand 
promoting all of these different visa schemes, all of these educational packages. Right. Uh, so it's it's the exact same thing. It's just uh, they're choosing to word it in, in the most insidious way possible. And again, notice how in this, this image that's frozen on the screen, there's all of these Chinese characters and they're just cherry picking certain words to make it look as bad you know, as possible. You know what? You're right. Actually, I want to expand on that. So ethnic unity, this is very, very, very deliberate. So... Um, this is uh, what they're saying, ethnic unity. But actually, what the way you translate is actually um, is actually national unity. That's actually the correct way to uh, uh, to translate it. And they, uh, sorry, that's that's a different thing. But they, re uh, Adrian Zenz reports very often deliberately mistranslate words. And uh, our friend uh, Gray Fox, he um, had a few points on this. With uh, you know, they they did it also with this. Uh, Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The first one, uh, national unity, was Mingzhu uh, uh, uh but this one is the Zhonghua uh, 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 Mingzhu, the one that I just said. This is the other uh, Chinese phrase that they regularly misrepresent. Um, so, in Adrian Zenz's report, it is interpreted to mean a uniform Chinese nation race. However, the Chinese government's definition includes all fifty-six races within Chinese borders, and. Um, we find that even in Chinese articles, it's meant to include every individual living in China. This isn't something that's targeting um, uh, Uyghurs and expecting them to assimilate with everybody else. This is just about national unity um, on a nation level, not erasing ethnic cultures for the purpose of unity. That's, there's nothing there that, uh, that even suggests that. Let's continue. Unity. The incentive to lie is very high. Um, again... <laughs> Can we apply this to you, Mr. Zenz? Who's he, who's he talking about story. himself? Yeah. <laughs> when we tell these companies we're journalists, they still say they don't use forced labor. And that blank certificate? The company says they didn't trust us. But the question... Re oh, well, well, okay. <laughs> they're fa a fake it, company. Why, they're, so their their intuition was right. They shouldn't have trusted them. Something, something absolutely. was off. I mean, it's like people were writing about this. It's like they were talking about the description was so very, very obviously fake. The name was like really, really super weird. It wasn't Richmond Incorporated. What are they said? It was like Richmond Beautiful Sunshine Company. Uh, you know, it was so they said that they what they should have said was they accurately. Uh, were suspicious of us. I mean, if it wasn't because of all of the bad uh, uh, Chinese alone, how about how about the fact that you're doing this call from a, a freaking studio with studio lighting and you're decked out in makeup and you're, you know, like, really, this is how people do Zoom calls? <laughs> I mean, couldn't you make it look a little bit more natural even the look on her face on the factory the the, the person working for the factory is like what what the what the hell is this what, <laughs> yeah what is i gotta be I, the customer's always right <laughs> yeah yeah you know, oh my god that's yeah. the look on her face this is like and and when you have to realize when there are so many malicious journalists out there who are desperately digging for anything that you say wrong or anything that you you know slip up on in terms of uh, not not necessarily slip up on but in terms of saying something that um, could be taken out of context all of a sudden they've got to be aware of these things so yeah. for me from my perspective if I was a um, if I was this company and I knew that we were under attack like this, I, I wouldn't want to send them my real company name. Now, I mean, they're, uh, they might already have their real company name because they reached out to them, but I wouldn't want to send them too many details because now my I know that my company is on a hit list. There's these journalists coming after me, and I know no matter what I say, I'm not going to be represented fairly. And you can very easily see that this report was, yeah. not, uh, was not a fair report. So they absolutely, they, they could see right through you is what happened. <laughs> yeah. Remains are these companies shipping their tomatoes here? To find okay, out. Hold on, we ho ho hold on one second. They're, they're just making this leap from these accusations of forced labor. They're, they 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 did their tours of the these virtual tours of these factories and fields. They have still not presented any evidence of forced labor. So now this whole next section is only going to be about 
we've discovered that tomatoes are grown in Xinjiang and then they get shipped out all over the world. That's the only thing they're going to prove in this entire, this entire presentation. The only thing they prove is that tomatoes grow in Xinjiang and they're shipped out all over the world. That's the only thing they're going to prove. Every, everything else about forced labor, you just saw, that's all they have. They, they never present even a shred of convincing evidence to, to suggest that there's coerced or, or forced labor. Absolutely. And uh, it, it is really awkward because this is really easy to trick the audiences. They have the, the right music. Um, they have the right framing. They have <laughs> Adrian Dents leaving out all of the most important details of his actual report. And where now all of a sudden we're going to see, okay, where are these we're going? Like, because, yeah. Well, <laughs> I just want to, I just want to point out this, this shot on the screen right now, it's like in some kind of giant abandoned theater, empty theater, and they're acting like it's yeah. like this giant war room that CBC has set up just to track, you know, Uyghur grown tomatoes all over the world. It's just so ridiculous. It's all theatrics. It's all purely for public consumption. There's nothing authentic about this entire CBC piece. It's just oh, yeah. all, all superficial yeah. to make up for the fact that there is no substance whatsoever to this report. And the average person, when this, when they get to this part of the segment where they're saying, let's see where the tomatoes are going. Oh, my God, they're ending up in your yeah. kitchen. And yeah. people are like, I should feel outraged about this. There was yeah. nothing really to substantiate that. But I just, for some reason, I feel like I should be outraged by this. <laughs> let's see what yeah. Exclusive shipping records. Exclusive shipping records. What is that? They're not going to clarify that. You can literally look up any bill of lading on the internet. Bill of ladings and ocean shipping is public. I do ocean shipping. Uh, you know, I ship product. And you can look this up. You can you can either find it in public information or you can you can sign up for a subscription where you can look through all the history of bill of lading uh, reports. So they want to and this happens very, very, it's a very common tactic with leaked Chinese documents or exclusive Chinese documents. And they're literally quoting stuff that China's putting out on the table, but it's not actually nefarious enough. There's not actually enough content in there that's, that, that says anything bad. But as soon as you add this label, like we found some secret information, all of a sudden the most normal things end up sounding completely nefarious. <laughs> and spend months tracking them. Uh, thousands and thousands of shipments. Oh my God. Get this. Big brands like Del Monte, Nestle, oh. and Unilever are purchasing Xinjiang tomatoes for their international factories. Oh my God. What's so the problem? What? We haven't so established. What? We yeah. haven't established what's the problem with that. I mean, there's a there's a a risk and, and again, very selective risk, but oh wow. Oh my God. I don't know why, but I just I suddenly feel like I should be outraged by this. We find these products on store shelves in Canada, including oh, Loblaw's own TNT Canada. and Walmart. Canadians Product are so India, friendly. Nestle. Product of the Philippines. Unilever, Pakistan. No mention of Chinese tomatoes or Xinjiang. We found all of these in our supermarkets. When I grew up in Germany, we had those brands. We know. Oh that no, not my childhood! It's confirmed. It's confirmed. That that is, I mean, <laughs> not my childhood. <laughs> again, no again, they're just it... building now. Now it's just like very common knowledge things that they're building on top of the the innuendo yeah. that there's forced labor going on, and this yeah. is supposed to reinforce the the non-existent claims that yeah. there's forced 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 yeah, labor. It's like, oh no, oh you're right. I I ate tomato sauce is red. Up. I, I yeah. <laughs> so like oh no oh my god it is I never thought it, it about it that same, way it is the same color as <laughs> communism I, I why didn't i make this why don't i make this connection before <laughs> from xinjiang is that concerning to you that's much more shocking than anything i would have guessed thing is companies don't have to disclose on the label where the tomatoes are grown they only have to detail where the tomatoes are packaged there definitely needs to be something done about our label laws. There's just too much that slides through the cracks. People should be able to be confident in the, the products that they buy. When we reach out, Del Monte confirms they use Xinjiang tomatoes, but say there's no worker exploitation. Okay. Okay. Hold and on then, a second. Yeah. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. There is no... Okay, so Del Monte says that there's no worker exploitation. Finally, 
finally, we have somebody who can bring some counterbalance. How, can we expand on this? Can we find out what kind of audits do you have? Um, do you do you, do you uh, participate in? Um, this is this is this is huge. Finally, we can have our counterbalance. Nestle says. Oh, oh, wait, hold on a second. We're going on to Nestle now. What happened? Yeah. What happened? You just said Del Monte said that there wasn't any uh, 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 forced labor or uh, exploitation. Can we please dig a little bit deeper and find out what went into their conclusion there? No, we're not going to do that. I'm sorry. Del Monte gave us the wrong answer. That's not what we're looking for. That's not the road exactly. we're looking to go down. Exactly. I'm sorry. Thank you, Del Monte. We have no further questions for you. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> It's really pretty much what they did too. <laughs> Forget about them. Let's get someone who's oh let's my get someone God. who's gonna yeah, backtrack let, let, on let's... using Xinjiang tomatoes. How That's can what people, we want. How can people get away with this? How can journalists like get away with this? There needs to be like kids growing up need to be need to be given the tools to see through this kind of BS because when you know what to look for, it's like, oh my God, this is this is shameful. <laughs> And and you guy. know that that oh sorry I was just gonna say that that chef there seems like he's a he's a pretty decent guy he's I'm sure he is you know, he he's just like he's just like I I was before I knew any of this stuff I would have probably fallen for all of this and and uh, that they know that that's their audience they're completely abusing the trust that they have in in the Western media they completely abuse it and and they know that that is the weakness of the public and they completely exploit it shamelessly exploit it this whole CBC piece is an exercise in exploiting the trust and general level of, of ignorance of the of the public and not ignorance in a disparaging way. They're just hardworking people that don't have time right. to spend hours studying this. That's all. That's all that means. You, you're, you're absolutely right. I have absolutely nothing against that guy. He's acting exactly and reacting exactly like most normal people would who don't expend as much time as we do on this stuff. Who I really just despise are these journalists who are supposed to be delivering the truth to people who are supposed to be doing their due diligence. And, and, and this is this is what they're doing. It's really, really shameful. Um, but you're right. That guy. Individually, I have nothing against him. Regulations and Unilever declines to comment. Which, but what does that mean? Are... Hold on. What does that mean? When they decline to answer, does that mean like they asked them like a day before it went out and they didn't even check their inbox or because they do that kind of stuff all the time. There's a lot of all things CBC just uh, claims that we're just supposed to buy. But uh, I, I would have additional questions to ask them about that. All the time. This happens all the time. I've experienced it personally. Um, I've been, uh, you know, so I've had a hit piece done on me by Al Jazeera. BBC came after me. SCMP came after me. And um, very, very common tactic. They reach out to you um, and they say, we, you know, we would like to ask you these questions and you have 24 hours to respond. It's like, oh, really? You don't really want my answers, do you? As soon as they do something like that, you know that they've pre-concluded something and they just want some sound bites that they can take out of context from you. If I, if I was one of these companies and, a, and a, 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 you know one of these news agencies was reaching out to me while there was such a propaganda push against uh, uh, Shinja, I would say the same thing. I'd say, nah, sorry, it's just not worth the risk. Um, or again, somebody at these companies, uh, somebody at one of these companies just didn't have enough time to respond because that's a very, like you said, a very common thing aren't the only ones you can see right there Loblaw companies Loblaw sells their own tomato products recognize this president's choice sauce getting product from Ladoria in Italy the Ladoria group has distilled the goodness of the Mediterranean well Loblaw's supplier Ladoria is based in Italy and a leading exporter of private brand tomato sauces constant focus on product quality and we know they purchase tomatoes from Xinjiang oh no you can see it there Italy to Montreal this looks so nefarious I have no idea why but I feel like I should be outraged by this they haven't sufficiently explained to me why but I just feel like I should be Ladoria well, they're, they're acting they like it's all hidden. They're they're acting like this is all hidden knowledge, and they're they're uncovering this dirty secret. But again, yeah. completely failed to demonstrate that there's forced labor taking place. Completely, it's, yeah, it's, it, it, yeah. It's an essential part. It's an essential part of manipulating people. Um, figuring out that 
and and I've I've seen it in like a debates or arguments too, where it's like, ah, so this is what you think, or this is what's the truth. It's like, yeah, that's out on the table. That's always been out on the table. But when they create yeah. it like an aha moment, it just seems like it's just something that you weren't supposed to know, and then you read into it way more than you're supposed to. Xinjiang tomatoes, just not for Loblaw in Canada. Do you think that Loblaw should be working with? a processor that admits to using tomatoes from Xinjiang? Absolutely not. Why? For ethical reasons. There's other producers that they could work with, right, that care about their products and what goes into them. If, if you're telling them wait, these wait. things... Yeah. No, no, let, 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 him, fi let him finish. He's going to... Okay. Because he's going to say... Yeah, he's, he says when you, if you're telling them these things and they're still w willing to work with, sh you know, Xinjiang tomato producers, uh, you know, but that's that's unethical. That's wrong. And I, I understand why he's drawing that conclusion, because right. CBC has been leading him along to think that there's this forced labor going on. But what if just continuing to buy tomatoes from Xinjiang? Because there is zero evidence. And they know the people making these claims make make claims of all all the time about this. And there's never any evidence. And there, it's a form of economic warfare. They're trying to ruin people's businesses. Uh, so what right. if that's the reason they keep doing business with uh, producers in Xinjiang? Right. Yeah. Let's see what Products he says. And what goes into him. If you're telling them these things and still work with these companies, um, you know, I think, you know, PC is something that you need to avoid. They, they, they like... I mean, it doesn't. Yeah, it, it again. It's just talking in generalities, and so w w I mean, what is he? I mean, this is a local uh, tomato guy. He's like, oh, buy local and stuff like that. Um, so what does that mean? Does that mean you buy local instead? I think there were there was somebody um who pointed out something really interesting here, which is kind of um an interesting irony or or hypocrisy or whatever you want to call it is actually it's just like well maybe we should buy from canadian farms let's see what happens to canadian farms human rights tribunal finds farm twenty three thousand five hundred for calling migrant workers monkeys migrant worker alleges kidnapping of local farmer after abuse complaints migrant worker who got covid19 says he was fired from ontario farm after speaking out canada are being told they can't uh Canada are being told they can't leave raising. Oh, I, I think I cut, I cut the top off. Uh, it, 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 migrant workers. It's like there are serious issues there, too. So how about we clarify this? It's uh, you want to stop buying from Xinjiang because of these allegations that aren't proven um, to buy from who? Like, tell us, who else do you want to buy from? I mean, locally? Uh, who locally? Because obviously there are actual proven cases that went through court here that uh, have some issues to deal with. So there's a little bit of an irony there. Um, but uh, again, they keep it ambiguous enough where you're like, yeah, yeah, this is what we're supposed to be thinking. <laughs> yeah. But after emails from us, Loblaw's supplier takes action making a dramatic change. The supplier, Ladoria, tells us that they're going to stop using Xinjiang tomatoes. But the question is, why are they stopping only in the wake of a media investigation? This is just- I have, an, an, I I have an answer. Me too, I have an I'll answer. let you go first. I'll let you go first. <laughs> They're, they're doing it because there is this propaganda war being waged against Xinjiang and everything coming out of it. And everyone knows how careful companies have to be about public perception. So whether it's true or not, they have to they have to err on the side of caution and they have to try to avoid being associated with even baseless claims of uh, forced labor because they know the public's going to buy into it the public buys into things these big companies sell them through marketing they uh, they understand the game that's being played here and so they're doing it to stay on the safe side it's not because they believe it and and CBC is going to do this until the end of this Xinjiang right. segment from now until the end, they're going to say, oh, they reversed it. They reversed it. They're not going to buy tomatoes from Xinjiang as if this is some sort of evidence that this forced labor is taking place. And it's not. It's only evidence that this propaganda war is having a serious, tangible impact on, on farming in Xinjiang, the livelihood of people in Xinjiang who, who work at these farms and uh, suppliers and supply chains. That's the only thing that this is proving. I mean, it, absolutely. Uh, my point that I wanted to make was pretty much the same. But what you can look at, what is the best that could happen? 
the best possible outcome that could happen, and I'm going to say this based on evidence, is that you could have what what happened to Skechers. Is Skechers says, okay, all right, we're going to investigate this. We're going to go in and we're going to go to the factories that were implicated in this report because we're using some of them and we're going to search for um, uh, forced labor and we're going to go on unannounced visits. And they did that. And they found that there was nothing there to support those claims. Does it, does do, do most average people know about this report that Skechers actually went there and said, uh, guys, nothing is matching up with what this report says. No, they don't know that. I that didn't is even your know that. best. Yeah. Th- th- yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, they, they hide it really well. That is your best possible outcome. Your worst possible outcome in a society and the most likely uh, outcome, considering how propagandized people is, is that people are going to say, how dare you try to justify this? Even, e- even if you come to the table with facts, even if you actually did your own audits, it's just not worth it. If I was this company also, I say, you look at the cost uh, benefit analysis and you say, when we do this, if we are going to refute this, this is how much effort and money and time we're going to have to spend towards refuting this bullshit. It's just not worth it. Let's just say, okay, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, we'll take it off of our shelves. We'll find our product from somewhere else. That's, of course, what's going to happen. I mean, and they know it and they know it and they, and they 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 take advantage of that CBC Absolutely. and the special interest driving reports like this and the people funding Adrian Zenz, uh, they know this and they take full advantage of that. Absolutely. That's a significant failure in terms of uh, ethical responsibility. Uh, there's a, this is a serious failure in terms of ethical journalism, let me tell you. As our search for answers continues, we find another connection to a major grocery store, Whole Foods. Oh, their no, supplier, Foods. tomato sauce maker Petty. With a- this is where all the yuppies buy their stuff. Oh no, not 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 Whole Foods. He's a ugh. long list of international clients. Ogni pomodoro che si rispetti. They make this paste for Whole Foods. And we have shipping records that show they import a lot of their tomatoes from Xinjiang. This is not acceptable that they would use a Western supplier that uses Xinjiang tomatoes anywhere in their process. Why? Why? But Petty Why? says it's not in the Whole Foods paste. It only uses Xinjiang tomatoes for their African markets. Oh. Is that a problem? Yes, it is. Pull, it pulling the race card here. Are using a product that carries a high risk of forced labor, and then they say, he said it again. To the- he said yeah. it again. A high risk of forced labor, not being produced through forced labor, a high risk. You know, I'm at a high risk of getting in an accident every time I drive in Bangkok here. I'm based in Thailand, but I don't get in accidents. So it's a it's risk and actual something happening are two completely different things. And you could have a risk and it never happens. Uh, so this is Adrian Zenz admitting the whole premise of this CBC report is flawed entirely dishonestly flawed i mean they know exactly what they're doing and they know that they need to include this fine print every single time and they never ever slip up they always have the fine print there because they know it's not true they know that they're pushing bs and i experienced it with the guy from france also and when i tried to really push him to clarify his point and put all of the pieces together and say, well, inadvertently, this is what you're admitting, that there is not enough evidence to say this. And they will never, ever, ever get caught saying that. And I have a, I have a French friend who's just so frustrated with uh, these kinds of uh, people who are destroying the relationship between China and France, who traditionally in, in, in history had really good relations with each other um, to pander to U.S. foreign policy. And... Um, he he said that my conversation with him with him was the first time that I really pushed him to expose himself, and he said, "But how do we how do we really uh, 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 finalize this piece?" And and um, you know, it's like I don't know how to explain it. It's like playing chess against a pigeon who knocks all the pieces off the board and, and craps on the board. The pieces are there, and we don't need to invent them. We just need to him to put them back on the table so we can finally say, "Well, this actually is a checkmate." You can already see it. But they're not willing, they're not willing to say clearly what they actually mean because they want to remain maliciously ambiguous in order to mislead the public. But when the the the, the gravity of how much uh, how full of BS this narrative is finally comes out, 
they're going to have a fallback. They're going to say, well, guys, actually, you know what? If you look carefully at what I was saying, I didn't actually say that. <laughs> yeah. But meanwhile, the audience it's, is already believing this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. West, but it's fine to sell it to Africans. As oh, no. Yeah, oh, that's no, what, because that's, that's the other thing that, so this is another thing they're heaping on top of this. There's still no evidence that it's done through coerced labor or forced labor. And, and now they're saying, oh, they'll give it to the, to the Africans, but not to the Canadians. So they're trying to introduce this, uh, actually a very common theme where they're accusing China and people related to China being racist against black people or Africans or African Americans. And it's completely irrelevant. There is no evidence that it's forced, that's coming from forced labor. There is no evidence. You can sell it to Africa. You could sell it to Canada. You could sell it to everywhere because there's no evidence. I mean, the, the whole premise of that, uh, that, that statement is just loaded ironically in racism yeah. saying, oh my God, they're selling it to the Africans who don't know any better. You know, uh, that's we in point. the West, yeah. we know, we know we're supposed to avoid Xinjiang uh, tomatoes. So in the absence of being able to pull a fast one over us, they're selling it to Africans who don't know any better, who don't care about human rights. That's so wrong. It's loaded. It's loaded in racism. It can't be that Africans can see through your bullshit. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not a possibility. It's because China's taking advantage of poor Africans who don't know better, who have no agency of their own. And this is a reoccurring theme that happens when African countries decide to build alliances with China. A, yeah. yeah. That's For a good Whole Foods, one. after we reach out to them, they take action too, removing their 365 pace from store shelves, as they put it, out of an abundance of caution. abundance of caution wait, wait 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 yeah wait so so hold on a second yeah we're gonna and this is the point that i want to really want to drive home later so they're gonna put Uyghur workers out of jobs they're gonna impoverish people ethnic minorities in china out of an abundance of caution well well well, well thank thank you very much we're not going to make sure that what the people who we've reached out to to find out what's really going on you know, if what they're saying is true, that Uyghurs are being put out of work because of uh, bogus media reports, we're not going to we're not going to approach that issue with an abundance of caution. We don't we don't give a shit about that. <laughs> and and you know? Whole Food is saying they they they're doing it out of caution because if it was proven that it was forced labor, they would obviously say, oh, my God, we didn't know it was forced labor. So what they're saying is we don't see any evidence of forced labor, but just to be on the safe side because you're making such a scene, uh, we're just going to to avoid this entire issue. Just like you said, it's uh, like a, they're looking at the cost of investigating it and clearing their name, and it's a lot easier to just avoid it Not altogether. It. So they're baseless accusations. This is what they're reacting to. It's not worth it, yeah. Take a look. They're all gone. And just days before this broadcast, they tell us they're cutting all ties with their supplier, Penny. You look so proud of yourself. You look so yeah. proud of yourself that you force these companies into cutting ties with suppliers based on nothing, really, on nothing. Nothing. Admittedly, nothing. Yeah. Admittedly, yeah. nothing. Abundance of caution. I'm, I'm glad they yeah. use that word, abundance of caution. You're absolutely right. You need an incredible abundance of caution to actually take action on this level of evidence. <laughs> that's the a first That's the first honest thing they've said so far. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. maybe we need a more powerful word than abundance, but at least it's in the right direction. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I think supermarkets have the biggest responsibility out of them all. Right. I mean, they are putting products on their shelves. If they have any type of moral compass, right, they won't hold these type of products in their stores. Poor guy. Do you have a story you really... want us to investigate? Uh, I have a yes, story I want, I want you, you to, to investigate. investigate your... <laughs> I want you to investigate why you guys are such muppets who don't do your job properly, who do the the, the you who put people like Tersenay on, who do no due diligence 
who has such poor logic and reasoning abilities. That's what I would like you to investigate, CBC. Do you think uh, is that is that possible? I mean, I could even help out if you want. I mean, um, maybe, maybe if maybe I get to use the giant uh, command center theater, if I get to use that, I, would, I will come in I would and love do it that. for them. This this is an instance where that giant command center is absolutely needed. We need a giant command center to cut through the level of BS that you just put out, CBC. <laughs> Write to us, marketplace at cbc.ca. <laughs> All right, so so this this part this part comes after I cut out the Mexico part uh, again. I don't know how much how much how loaded that is in BS. You you need to find a specialist in Mexico to tell you that. Um, and maybe the Mexico the Mexico piece was uh, quite a bit shorter than the Xinjiang one. It could be something to add balance to make it seem like they're not really specifically targeting China. But I have no idea whether to believe their Mexico segment or not. I err on the side of not believing them because of what they just did on, on a, uh, abundance of caution. I'm about. going to ignore what they said. About I'm going to I'm going to use abundance of caution. And say that you guys are absolute muppets who don't know how to do your job, and say that anything you say is full of BS. I mean, it's, it's only fair, right? I mean, this is how an abundance of caution works, right? I think mine is actually a little bit more justified than yours. But let's see what let's see how you wrap this up after the two segments. With no help from the industry, how can we really know what we're buying? It's actually great that you took the time as journalists to investigate this issue, but it shouldn't be your responsibility. It should be the responsibility of the supermarkets who, who make the more profits from, from the, the sales of those products. Is this going to change the way you shop for tomato? Now, this is, this is the part where they reinforce it, you know? They're like, guys, um, we want to make sure that uh, we, we show you how you're supposed to act after watching our piece. I think that there should be a list of ethical producers, and we as, com we as consumers should flex our muscles and support those producers. Look at her. She's so precious that like, you got it. That's exact. That's, exactly <laughs> that's what, what we were looking wanted. for. Don't oh. be a Del Monte. Don't be I'm a so Del Monte. <laughs> I'm so happy you came to that conclusion based on nothing. Information <laughs> yeah. is power. So if you respect your consumer, then you should give us the information that we need to make good decisions about the products that we buy. And what message do you have then for grocers about this problem? Do better. <sighs> CBC, do better. Do better. Go show me oh. the evidence of forced labor. You did a whole you did a whole piece which you're taking credit for stopping suppliers, like cutting off suppliers. You're taking credit for that. And you have not shown any evidence of forced labor. That is just atrocious. This is this is something that I, I, I I'm not I'm not a lawyer or anything, but it just seems like something somebody should be able to sue someone over. Because they are ruining bus people's businesses and livelihoods doing this. And there is not, a, even Adrian Zenz, their expert that they brought in, said there's a high risk. He didn't say that it was happening. He said it twice, right. not once, twice. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I think this is the part where it gets a little bit complicated. I think we pretty much said everything we need to say about this. But um, what I want to do is I want to add a little bit of uh, background context that comes through in a lot more detail in our work elsewhere, while again, trying not to repeat too many things that our existing subscribers know. The U.S. wants to smash China back down. The way that they accomplish this, sometimes by smashing countries back down, is by sanctions. They've done this all over the world. Uh, they've admitted that the sanctions are, they have a malicious intent. Let me see what, what kind of pictures I have here for sanctions. Uh, I like this one. Alan McCloyd, he showed that actually uh, somebody put re something really interesting in where, where they actually did a really good article on New York Times where they showed the, the true effect of sanctions, where they started out saying how sanctions hurt Iranian women. And then within 24 hours, they actually changed the titles and they changed it to the middle class women of Iran are disappearing. And the United States is partly is partly to blame. Um, and uh uh, Alan was saying the story appears to have been changed uh, to be live for 24 hours before it changed. So what likely happened is a higher up saw what was written and demanded it to be changed, uh, lest it undermined support for deadly sanctions against Iran. Here's one. Our well-meaning sanctions. Venezuela's kids are dying. Are we responsible? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, when you sanction places like Cuba and Venezuela to the level that you are, you absolutely are 
uh, responsible. And Richard Nephew, who is working with the Biden administration, openly admitted in his book, The Art of Sanctions, that it is economic warfare and it is designed to drive up unemployment. So what's going on now is they're trying to turn consumers and companies against Xinjiang to increase unemployment in Xinjiang to create civil unrest in China. Now, there is an additional element that goes together with that. Multiple studies have shown that terrorism is rampant in, vi in environments of uh, poverty. And so one of China's key tools against fighting extremism in Xinjiang, and there was a lot of it, and we'll get to that point in a second, it was um, job opportunities and lifting people out of poverty. So when you had the ETIM delisting, so U.S. removed separatist group condemned by China from their terror list, ETIM, also known as TIP in Syria. They operate under the TIP banner in Syria. Um, they cited that the reason they removed it is because they don't exist anymore, which is already a BS uh, answer. Be, you know, the Tamil Tigers haven't existed for even longer, and um, they are still on the terrorist list. And then so you, have, of course, had some articles that came out that were a little bit more honest, saying China could face a greater terrorism threat as the USD lists, the ETIM movement, experts say. Then you actually ended up having people come out like um, Sean Roberts saying, why did the United States take China's uh, word on supposed weaker terrorists, saying that they should have never been on the ter terrorist list, saying that they barely existed. This is an interesting guy, Sean Roberts. He wrote a book. I read his book. I read it. And it was talking about how horrible it was that weaker children in China were also learning Mandarin, the national language of their country. And then he goes on to talk about the weaker children in Syria who are training in ISIS camps and being trained to use weapons by terrorists and saying and whitewashing it, saying, well, it's not that bad because I looked at it and they have really great holiday parties. <laughs> it's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. And some people are even coming out and saying, well, well, so like Sean Roberts, there's actually more people coming out and saying, well, they never really existed, even though just a few years ago, the U.S. was literally admitting that they were bombing Uyghur terrorists from Xinjiang in Afghanistan and running airstrikes on them. And that now there are ETIM. ETIM is uh, in Syria. They are displacing Kurds in Syria, in Idlib. Um, they are working together with Al Qaeda and ISIS. They are beheading uh, a people who are non-Muslim. And if you just if you if you want to if you want to say that this is not a real issue, because that's what people are going to convince you. I want to show you some short clips here. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going on for a bit, Brian. I don't know if you've got you're, you're going to have some stuff to add too. But um, the, these are children. They also featured young Uyghur school children shouting threats to the Chinese government in Syria. This isn't from Chinese state media. That that one is ABC. This one, the CCTV re-aired. This is a video by an ETIM member. And this is a video by ISIS. Because a lot of Uyghur kids are training in... Um, ISIS built camps in Syria. This is going on now. And the West, uh, Western governments, they know these people exist. And this is why they're not creating an open policy for Uyghurs, because they know that some of these people from these areas might end up. Oh, let's see this. Here. That's a uh, TIP member talking about he'll come back to Xinjiang and kill the Chinese people. So. That's what we're that's what we're looking at. They really exist. I, I just to just really drive this point home. I want to show you guys a video of a new ETIM recruitment video. Let me fast forward a bit. I had some uh, military people look at this and they were saying that these guys are absolutely 100% very very professionally trained uh, trained when you look at how they handle the weapons and everything like that. And just to let you guys know, I'm going to turn the volume down. This the, the music is cool. They make it really fast. The music is cool, but I'm going to turn it down for a second so I can talk to you. You can hear me as, I'm, as the video is playing, right? Yes. 
Okay, so uh, I I have an interview on my channel with somebody who was affiliated with Al Qaeda when he was younger, um, and uh, he explains all of this in great detail. And he's the one who is regularly monitoring and still in contact with ETIM and Al Qaeda and keeping an eye on what's going on. He's not. He completely rejects um, these groups now. I have, as I said, I have an interview on my channel, but this is an actual real threat. And I can tell you, these people are going uh, to Syria and they're carrying out jihad in Syria against a common enemy of the West, against Assad. And this is why they don't really care. And they even support them. And um, But had these terrorists been going to the West and carrying out jihad in the West, all of a sudden the story would be totally different. I've made this point before for uh, subscribers of mine. You'll, you would have heard this before. The story would have been about China not doing enough to control terrorism and um, being a net exporter of terrorism, an exporter of terrorism to the West. Uh, but since that's not happening, and we recently saw ETIM attacking Belt and Road Initiative points um, in Pakistan, killing Chinese people, this could be a very, very valuable tool for the U.S. And the U.S. is very well known for supporting terrorists to accomplish their uh, geopolitical goals. And so to bring this back in, that might have sounded like a very big detour off of our topic. Sanctioning Uyghurs, removing their employment opportunities is a very, very essential part of that as well. So it's kind of a double bonus for them. One, they can create social unrest in China, but also they can restore the environment that will allow ETIM to restore a foothold in Xinjiang, and which is why it was essential for the U.S. to remove ETIM from the terrorist list uh again there's a lot more detail than that than i go that i go in on, in my other videos but i want to leave it at that point and and brian if you want to add some more i'll let you take over from here sure um can i share my screen yep so uh you you were just saying you know they they claim that etim doesn't exist anymore uh and and they're trying to downplay it but this is from september this year this is this is ETIM doing an interview with Newsweek. So they definitely exist. And this is just a game that they play. They did the same thing with the Mujahideen al Khalik from Iran. They were saying they didn't exist anymore, but they're running around New York City. They are terrorists. Worse still is that in their past, they had killed Americans, a lot of Americans, and the U.S. is supporting them. So this is something they do over and over again. And uh, I like to show people this article from the L.A. Times uh, from 2016, in China, rise of Salafism fosters suspicion and division among Muslims. And what this was all about was a Saudi state sponsored Salafism, uh, extremism, radicalization was overriding indigenous Uyghur Islam. This was the actual cultural genocide that was taking place. This is what Adrian Zenz is always complaining about China undoing. They're undoing this. They're not undoing what was already going on in Xinjiang. This is something China's trying to restore. AP just did an article where they went to Xinjiang and they saw the Chinese government investing in Uyghur culture, Uyghur, uh, the Uyghur version of Islam that has been practiced for generations. They're investing in that. They're not, they're not erasing it. They're erasing this Saudi state-sponsored Salafism. And now why is this important? It's, it's because this is what the U.S. does everywhere. It's what the Saudi, uh, Saudi government and the U.S. did in Afghanistan in the 80s to expel the Soviets from Afghanistan. It's what they're doing in Syria right now. You were just talking about that, Daniel. There's uh, thousands of Uyghur extremists fighting alongside other Western-sponsored extremists in Syria to overthrow the government. And we're going to always hear that uh, if they do admit to like this BBC article here from 2014 about Uyghur violence, uh, Uyghur extremism, they're going to say it's because they're chafing under policies from Beijing. But that's not true. They're extremists. They seek what they think is jihad and martyrdom, and they'll they'll seek it anywhere they can. They're in Syria fighting Damascus. What does that have to do with Beijing? Because they're extremists. They're not thinking rationally, and they're being used as a, a pawn in this geopolitical game. If you look at this BBC article, they never talk about any of this anymore. The BBC will never sit and list all of these hor horrific terrorist attacks but you could go to this article and you can see they're killing scores of people at a time, and not just in Xinjiang, all over China, outside of China. I, I said there was a, an attack in 2015, a year after this article was written here in Bangkok, 20 people blown up in the center of the city. So th this was 
global terrorism coming out of Xinjiang. This is what China was responding to. This is what yeah, they're trying Afghanistan, to rectify. Uh, Afghanistan, there was a recent attack on a mosque also, right? Yeah, yeah. I think there, I think yeah. there, there's been a series of attacks now. And yeah. uh, that's what the, the U.S. is the doing. First one, dusting the first one was off. a Uyghur specifically. Yeah. 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 So, so this is what's going on. Uh, China, China's version of the war on terror is uh, de-radicalizing people, uh, giving them jobs, creating social stability for these people. The U.S., their version of the war on terror is the last 20 years where they've destroyed nation after nation, creating a swath of death and destruction from North Africa to Central Asia. When there's when they know where there's extremists, they carpet bomb it. China brings people in to give them an education and find them jobs. And this is what the U.S. is very insidiously trying to sabotage China's constructive way of dealing with this. Right. For exactly the reason you mentioned, Daniel, it's because they want to continue destabilizing the region. They have a encircle and containment policy of China that's been ongoing for decades. And Xinjiang is just one of several areas they're working on, Tibet, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, and then dismantling their allies in Southeast Asia, and, and the list goes on and on. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I think the, the most important point, it's, it's one that I've made many times as well, was that was when the real uh, genocide was going on, when these uh, uh, Salafist extremists were coming in and trying to impose a very strict um, interpretation of Islam onto the people of, we, uh, uh, of Xinjiang. And, and that was not a part of their culture. You know, they weren't wearing niqabs before. Uh, Uyghur culture has uh, a thousand year history with winemaking. But, you know, Uyghurs who were drinking alcohol were being uh, persecuted. There were cases of people having their ears cut off and stuff like that. That, that absolutely was when the uh, cultural genocide was happening. And if you want to say to yourself, if you want to say that China, that's just what China does is cultural genocide. You know, obviously, uh, Tibet was the first one also where they said full on genocide and they downgraded it to cultural genocide. There was a temple that they said was destroyed by China because they were removing, they were destroying, uh, uh, you know, Tibetan culture. And then the next year, China was putting it on was putting it on an application for the UNESCO World Heritage sites. It was still there, you know. Um, Tibet, in Tibet, they're investing millions. The Beijing government is met, investing millions and millions of dollars to bring back ancient styles of tanka, where they do these kinds of uh, colorful paintings on the wall that didn't even exist at the time when the Dalai Lama left um, in Mongolia. And in Mongolia, they're still using the original mongolian script they're not even using the original mongolian script in mongolia kyrgyz people in xinjiang they still the young kyrgyz people they sp still speak kyrgyz but in kyrgyzstan most young people or many young people they don't even speak that language anymore they only know how to speak russian i i mean if 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 china is somebody is a country that engages in cultural genocide they do a terrible terrible job at it uh, ethnic minorities across the board they weren't subject to the one child policy when, when the one child policy was implemented before it was only applied towards the han chinese now there's more equal policies across the board but for years and years and years it was only han chinese that were subject to that nobody was talking about a han chinese genocide at that point targeted birth control for han chinese they're not talking about how Ethnic minorities in China can get into top universities with lower scores. They're not talking about all the prefer preferential policies for them because it goes against their narrative. Again, you're, you're, produced the, you're, you're given these selective narratives, and it is, it is so far from the truth. This, uh, going through this CBC uh, report, it was a very, very uh, valuable um, lesson, not only to better understand what's going on with the Xinjiang narrative, but to keep in mind... This is how they manipulate you across the board. And people have been fooled enough times over and over again uh, when there is a, a, a geopolitical enemy or target from the U.S. Uh, that that also should be additional incentive for you guys to expect uh, more evidence, expect uh, more robust evidence being uh, produced before you come to conclusions. Yeah, and uh, I, I just want to maybe conclude on... This, this isn't just a malicious lie that CBC is telling to poison the Western public against China, the Chinese people, the Chinese government, China's economy. This is doing tangible damage, and they're proud about it. It's right here. Supermarket pulls product, Italian supplier to stop using Xinjiang tomatoes after marketplace investigation. 
There was no investigation at all. They showed absolutely no evidence of forced labor. All they showed was these companies get their tomatoes from Xinjiang, which all of these companies already knew about. They're pulling their products off the shelf because they are worried about public perception. CBC and other mainstream media corporations are putting these ideas out into the public's mind that this is all coming from slave labor. Nobody wants to be associated with that. Even if it's not true, they don't want to be associated with it. And so they play it safe and they take those products off the shelf. Those are suppliers, business owners, and employees that are going to uh, lose their jobs or they're going to uh, be set back at, at the very least. It's real economic damage they're doing. This is why they're telling this lie. There's no secret that the West is worried about China surpassing them. This has not, not happened in, in, in history. We don't really remember the last time a non-white nation was going to take number one position in the world. They, they will do everything to stop this. We've seen what they've done with their primacy. What will they do to protect their primacy? Absolutely. And there's going to be some stuff uh, that I didn't prepare here, but I'll overlay it and post where I'll show you some examples of companies, uh, Western companies or companies tied to, uh, you know, who have Western uh, customers who are literally sending Uyghur workers home. They're saying, I'm sorry, we can't employ you anymore. And they're sending them home uh, because it's just not worth the risk. Because they know that when they have Uyghur workers, that the natural assumption is that there's no way they would have come voluntarily. They must have been forced to come here. And they're literally putting Uyghurs out of work. They're, they're accomplishing exactly what they want. There's a video that I'd like to end on that really summarizes some of the key points about uh, what the, the truth was behind the uh, reports, the, the main factual things. Let me just play that here. When we tell these companies we're journalists, they still say they don't use forced labor. So uh, let me stop there. When they tell them that they are journalists, they tell them the same thing that they told them when they didn't tell them they were journalists, that they don't use forced labor. So there's no point to even say what she just said. It sounds a little bit suspicious when she says it like that, but they consistently said that they don't use forced labor. Okay, thank you. When we reach out, Del Monte confirms they use Xinjiang tomatoes, but say there's no worker exploitation. That was the key point. Also, they found somebody who said that there was no forced labor, but we got no further dialogue with this company in terms of what kinds of audits they do or anything like that. Again, because it's the wrong narrative. For Whole Foods, after we reach out to them, they take action too, removing their 365 pace from store shelves, as they put it, out of an abundance of caution. Oh, you look so proud of yourself, don't you? She looks so proud of herself that she is removing employment opportunities for ethnic minorities in China for an abundance of caution on a story that proved absolutely nothing, but was presented and manipulated in such a way that it's going to make everybody think that, yeah, of course, this is what we should do. I mean, just sh shame on you, CBC. Shame on you. I think I think we got everything. I think we covered everything we need to do. Do you want to wrap up with anything else or was that it? That, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, people just need to keep pushing back against this. This is doing real damage to real oh, people. And uh, it's, it's not just going to be confined to uh, China and people living in China and trying to make a living. This is going to affect everybody. There's companies in the West that do business with China that are going to be impacted by this as, as this continues to expand. And we just have to look at how the West has been running their society, their, you know, their collective society uh, in the last couple of decades, how everything is going down the tubes because they are pursuing this unsustainable uh, hegemony over the planet that they, they seek to maintain. It, it, it cannot be maintained. And everyone in the West is going to suffer as they try to do so anyway. It's completely irrational. We, we see that it's not working, but they're going to continue doing it. So if you don't care about people in China, care about yourself. This is, this is a dead end that the West is pursuing. And uh, yeah, everyone is I mean going to lose in the end. I, I hope this, again, serves as a, uh, a good example, not only for this particular issue at hand, but um, keeps people alert in terms of what to look out for on other things completely unrelated to this specific topic. 
um, in regards to how media manipulates you and what bad journalism looks like, really. So how about we wrap it up here, Brian? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll t yeah good. Sounds good. We'll, 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 well, we'll see everybody else uh, in the next video. Uh, thanks for joining and sticking around for this long. And uh, as I said, we'll see you in the next one. Take care.